Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, this is Matthew Struck, and uh, I'm joined with a number of the leaders here from the New Jersey CPC Society chapter. Uh, really quickly, we wanted to shoot a video just kind of talking about uh, some of our um, experiences with um, remote work and, and what's going on in the insurance industry. What's really nice is we have a decent cross-sectional leaders here, and so we're going to introduce them really quickly across the board. Um, and so I'm going to start off with our current present president, uh, Laura Panesso. Um, she's with ISOVerisk. Uh, we have Rich Morales also with ISOVerisk. We have Rick Serrato with SML Capital Advisors. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Rita Williams Boger, who is our executive director, and she is with. Uh, I always get this wrong, Rita. Personal development solutions or professional development solutions. Personal, although I think we should change it because people like to call it professional development solutions. Yeah, <laughs> I, it, it definitely, uh, I, I can see the effectiveness in both realms. I, I think a lot of your client base is more kind of company and organization based, but um, I, I think uh, also help a lot of people individually as well on the on the personal side. So I'm, I'm glad it's it's called that because I think it actually, it works to that effect. So. Uh, Really quickly, I just want everyone to kind of like introduce themselves with a quick little intro. I think the flavor of the past couple of weeks has been adapt and overcome, right? And each one of us has a certain level of familiarity with remote work or with technology in, in our everyday business life. Um, but what's one kind of example maybe of how you've had to adapt and overcome within the last couple of weeks? I, Rich, we'll get someone else from ISOVerisk. Uh, what's an example of how you guys have had to adapt and overcome? So previously, um, for about a year and a half, maybe two years, we had a remote work policy uh, where once or twice a week we'd be allowed to work from home or a remote location. Uh, this was full time every day of the week for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and that did take some adjusting because people would generally tailor their week based on their availability in the office, who they would be in front of, uh, to try to benefit from that face time or the resources available to them. And all of a sudden that changed. So the first week was definitely kind of adjustment for everyone. Uh, a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings. Now going into week two, week three, People are settling in, and, and, it, and it's nice to see how quickly we can all adapt to, you know, this new environment. And actually, I think in, there are a lot of positives coming out of this. We can get into some of that maybe later on. Sure. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the, the world we live in is definitely going to be different in the future. That's for sure as a result of this. Um, Rick, uh, you're kind of used to, like, running and gunning, right? Uh, you're you're, a, you're a, uh, an audit guy who's running to client appointments or, or doing um, work with your team, right? I mean, has this really affected you? Has there been certain kind of hurdles that you've had to get over? Well, yes. I, I've been working from home for 15 years, and, and my staff is all over the country, and they book their own appointments and go out and visit insureds. What completely changes is doing everything remotely. Everybody's working from home. Uh, I'm seeing most businesses are working remotely. Uh, you know, people that have to be either in the office or at their job site are still working, but everyone else is doing like what we're doing and, and they're working from home. Right. So um, our work from, went out from visiting policyholders to not doing that at all and doing everything in a virtual manner. Yeah. Now, does that impact the audit process? I mean, it, it might lose something, right? Not being able to be personally there for, for an audit. Is that, I mean, has that been something that's been a significant change for you guys? Well, yes, because you're not seeing body language when you're asking questions about certain things and, and responses. But uh, the way that the technology has evolved, that people can um, obtain their banking or, or records from their payroll service or QuickBooks, even if it's in the office, they can they have a way of uh, accessing that if they're working from home. So right. the actual uh, audit product or the records that we're looking at really has not changed. Okay, so I'll kick it over to you, Rita. Um, you've 
been you've been working on your own for a long period of time as kind of like a solopreneur, right? Uh, you have to do a correct. lot of remote work and, and remote teaching. Is that right? That's correct. So you're right, solopreneur it is. And on one hand, I'm an adjunct faculty member for an online university, Walden University. So I've been teaching remotely for 15 years. So that, to me, that's that's just what you do. Yeah, yeah. And most of my workshops are face-to-face, -face, where the client wants you in front of their staff members, or if I'm facilitating on behalf of a local college, they want you in front of their clients, which is fine. I love doing the in-person, face-to-face teaching. The challenge that I'm having is since everything that's been face-to-face -face is canceled or postponed, it's helping clients see they can still get the same information remotely. Right. So some of the couple of the colleges are all of a sudden realizing, oh yeah, you can do your class online <laughs> using WebEx <laughs> or Zoom. I've had to actually share with take them through the experience of being an online learner. Yep. So that they can see, yes, this really does work. Yeah. So that's the biggest adjustment. Oh wow. Yeah, I, I can say, you know, to 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 put my my personal take on this from from the retail broker perspective, a lot of what I do is relationship based, um, and that relationship piece I think is the most difficult. I don't think anyone has discounted the idea that you know remote work or or kind of like this more on demand type work. Um, would be more efficient or at the least more flexible. Um, I think most people have understood that a, a lot of the anti argument has been against, um, you know, whether or not you can build human relationships as a result of having to, you know, continually digitally interact like this um, versus, you know, a handshake and a, and bricks at the, the body language in person. So it has been difficult from that, from that standpoint. Um, I was actually, I, I've been doing on Facebook recently these kind of like crazy quarantine question of the day kind of things. Um, yeah. And uh, my next one, I think, is probably going to be something along the line of, so are we still demonizing millennials for this instant gratification, want to go anywhere kind of mentality that's given rise to these companies that's now basically allowed us to order in food and have on demand, you know, uh, uh, entertainment at our TV or... Are, are we good now? Like, <laughs> do, we, do we finally understand where they're coming from, right? Um, all right, uh, really quickly, I, I can always cut this out, but uh, Laura, have you been able to get back on the, the audio? Try now? Oh, yeah, yeah. look, we got yeah. you. Yes, right. all right, um, awesome. You, you have, uh, I think you and Rich both have leadership responsibilities. Um, you have a team that you oversee at ISO. Um, ISO I mean, has that, how is this, situation complicated your role there um, you know, as, as basically overseeing that group of folks? So my team is generally in the office all together every single day with a remote day here or there. Hmm. Um, we are allowed to work one day a week from home, but most of my team does, does not do that. So it, it's been a real change in, in how we work. I think though we're, we're doing really well. We're communicating every day. We have a team meeting to keep connected. Um, we're chatting and, and calling and, and emailing. I think the most important lesson has been the, the necessity to call, not just email. Um, I've seen some teams resorting to emails instead of calls. And you know I already got about 100 emails a day. Uh, I think it's up to about 200 now um the real way to continue to get work done is to to call whether that be skype or teams or you know pick up the phone right and that way i think we're we're more working efficiently like we generally do in the office as opposed to kind of a, a slowdown where you're inundated with email and you're not getting to things in time right so calls have have really been i think key to us pulling together and, and continuing to move forward yeah I mean, has anyone, I, you guys can volunteer, you know, whoever wants to speak to this, has anyone seen clients really kind of struggling with this transition? Um, you know, I, I have a couple of clients that are very much like, 
you know, manufacturing type clients, or I, I have mm -hmm. a couple that are, you know, bar restaurant purveyors that are just getting hammered in terms of the, the revenue loss. But I, I think more in terms of like the, the white collar realm, do you have folks on the other end of the phone that are um, having difficulties as far as making this transition? Or has it just been a matter of, you know, necessity has uh, caused a lot of people to kind of do something that maybe they felt all along that they've had to do for a while? Well, when you think about it, this is a type of change. Yep. So people also go through the different stages that are involved in change. One of them being, oh my God, what's happening? Yeah. And shock and denial and confusion and anger and frustration. And what I've noticed is from the white collar realm, there are a number of people who were basically told, here's a laptop, go home, log in. Right. And so they're trying to figure out how does this how does this work? How do I develop a routine? How do I develop systems? What do I do when I get up every day? <laughs> yeah. How do I handle this? So I've seen some of the frustration and yeah. the angst that comes with not feeling like they're doing their job fully. I've heard from other clients of mine that they feel they're super busy now, busier than they were when they were going into the office every day. Right. So this has been an adjustment. Yeah. I pretty shameless plug here. Uh, you just recently had a video interview that you did with um, Antonio Canas from uh, Profiles in Risk, right? And it had to do with um, what, managing teams remotely? Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. De definitely a video I think folks should um, look to. I, Lord, did you have something that uh, you wanted to say? I, you work with a lot of like regulators, right? Has it been impossible to get people on the phone? I do. It actually hasn't been too bad. There's been a few states that have issued bulletins saying that their time frames for a review of filings is going to be a little bit longer than typical. But in many cases, states already work from home a day here or there, and it's been pretty pretty seamless. Okay. Of course, their focus has been on responding to COVID-19, so their attention has been kind of elsewhere. But in terms of, of working with them, in many states, it's been kind of business as usual. Yeah, uh, that, that sounds familiar. Yeah, I've, I've, I have a lot of public entity clients as well, and it's very much a triage kind of situation, right? Like you're, there are certain things that you can put on the back burner, and then there are others that are you know, essential must-dos, um, and it seems like those folks are the ones that are picking up the phone or answering the email a little bit quicker than, mm -hmm. than the other folks that are have some of the lower priority, um, you know, kind of responsibilities, and some of them have actually been repurposed, which is part of the, the risk management plan that a lot of these organizations have implemented. Um, Rick, you, you mentioned using, like, QuickBooks and remote banking software and stuff like that for your clients or, or the folks that you're um, kind of helping through the audit process. Have you noticed that some are still a little old school and they've had some difficulty, uh, you know, helping you facilitate that audit? Actually, not really. Um, it seems to be business as usual for us um, as far as contacting policyholders. My ultimate customer, though, is insurance carriers. And since everybody's working remotely, it's been pretty seamless as far as getting hold of or communicating with the, somebody in the insurance carrier or, or an MGA because everybody's home like like we are working. <laughs> I Yeah, what's funny is some of the people that don't pick up the phone normally are picking up the phone now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, Rich, to, to, to your role, um, you're doing more um, kind of like back-end optimization stuff, right? I mean, is there is there a customer on the other end of the line, or is it more kind of like internal company personnel that you're working with? So we have heard of pockets of issues, but in general, it's it really has been business as usual. My, my one concern, and personally, yeah, I get off, you know, I I my day around four thirty, five o'clock, and it just I have to decompress because you know I have the kids kind of coming in and out all day. I'm, I'm helping them out. You know, I just want to make sure that whether we're in a state of denial or we're just putting our best face put forward, that we really are taking care of ourselves. Right. Um, you know, it's been, for some people, it's been two weeks. For some people, it's been three. And then around us, you know, there's a lot of 
bad news and, and, and some tragedy going on. So, you know, that's my concern as we kind of continue down this path, but it, it really is impressive how, you know, we can kind of group together around this, this common social issue and, and try to do our best, right? It's almost like this is what we can do to at least help the problem, right? Or make the recovery a little better yeah. down the road. Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, we can go down that this line if you want on this conversation. Um, I, I work with a couple of nonprofits, uh, and the 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 nonprofits have been just as adaptable, if not more so, than a lot of the the for profit businesses that are out there. I'm actually shameless plug. I'm, I'm wearing my um, Kids Chance of New Jersey T-shirt here, um, and so you know, Kids Chance for anyone who's unfamiliar is a charity that we support as as the CPCU chapter and. They give scholarships to kids whose parents were injured in workers' comp accidents. You know, they had a number of their, um, not their largest yet. Hopefully, it doesn't get to that point because that's more of a, a summer event. But they've had some of their larger fundraising endeavors thwarted as a result of this. So they've had to come up with some more, um, some more innovative, you know, ways to do fundraising or at least be more active in terms of their remote fundraising. Um, and to your point, I, I, I think I see a lot of the community mobilizing in a way, you know, if you just watch the, the media, you would think that it was, you know, World War Three and it's every man for themselves and all the crabs are trying to get to the top bucket, right? I see so many pockets of people that are um, either donating personal protective equipment or um, finding ways. I, one of the more novel approaches I saw was I live in Morristown. I see one of the companies, um, with the restaurants here, uh, is actually trying to um, join their effort to get more people to to get takeout from them with a a, a, pro, a not for profit cause of feeding kids who might be um, let out because they're not getting their meal from school or whatnot. Um, have you have you seen any of that? Are you involved in any of that? Um, and just because you kicked off, I'll, I'll keep it with you, Richard. Have you seen any of that kind of more innovative stuff on the on the humanitarian or the social side? Yeah, within our social circles, whether it's, uh, you know, my uh, friends through our, our our kids groups, just kind of like getting on a Facebook group and say, hey, can we all collectively order a few pizzas and send it over to the hospital? Um, so and so, you know, I, I have seen that and I've seen others, you know, take part in, in things like that. Awesome. I Are you guys uh, maintaining your sanity? You're in the same spot I am. You got multiple kids homeschooled during this situation. <laughs> I think I've lost my sanity at this point. So <laughs> <laughs> just approaching everything with a smile. Hey, you just take you just take the next hit whenever you can, and then get back up again. I think exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, Matt, I, I did, I did right. bring up a good. Um, I know Rita and I both have worked at home for a long time, and uh, somebody told me once, and this is a good saying for everybody. That when you work from home, work never leaves you. So uh, for you folks that have young kids at home, just because you're working from home, there's a certain point that you have to shut the computer off for the day and the phone. And uh, I, the last two weeks, I've consciously had left the computer off and, and my phone on mute. So uh, I'm not trying to constantly check emails. So, um, you know, everybody has to kind of figure out their own work-life balance. And what that is, because otherwise you could want to work working 90 hours a week and not, not realize it at some point. Right, right. I, I also I hear my phone's ringing right now. It's buzzing, so you <laughs> should. Sorry. I because what I found is now that I'm not going anywhere somewhere to facilitate a workshop, my days are actually short. So six o'clock comes and I say, I can actually stop. <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness! Yeah. <laughs> it's not time to start the next the next round of things that I need to do. And to that point, I consciously shut down and I physically close the door to my office and say, "Personal development solutions is closed," because otherwise, you just walk across the hall or bring the laptop with me or the surface with me, and work continues. So you end up working more hours normally. Now, now uh, 
you and Laura share something in common. You're both, uh, you're both runners. Um, I'll, I, I think I, your, your sharing of your, your running adventures is prolific on Facebook. Anyone who's not connected with Rita um, and, and you want to be Facebook friends with her, um, you know, assuming she knows who you are, or at least you're, you're, uh, you're remotely connected to her, she might connect to you and, and you could see her, her exploits here running. But um, I think uh, Rita's maintained a, a pretty high level of activity. activity. Um, what about you, Laura? Have you been able to get out? I mean, you ran a marathon what, a handful of months ago, right? Um, what have you been able to do uh, since? 2018. Okay. Um, I ran, well, I ran New York in 2018. I was scheduled to do two half marathons this spring. They've both been canceled. Oh. The one in May just canceled this past week. Um, but I'm actually training for the 2020 New York City Marathon. So I have continued to run five days a week religiously, which keeps me sane. I don't post it on Facebook like Rita, but it's the... Uh, <laughs> At this point, it's the only part of my day that I totally have to myself because my husband and college-aged daughter are now home all day also. So I, I look forward to that hour, two hours that I can get out of the house and, and run and have some time to myself. Definitely the one thing keeping me sane at this point. Yeah. Uh, what's, that, uh, what's, that, what's that like being... You, you weren't an empty nester for a long period of time, right? Like, it was only a couple of months, or, or I forget. What year in college is your daughter? She's a freshman, but she lives at home, so never okay. quite an empty nester. But, yeah. but she was working 20-plus hours a week at the mall, class, two full days a week. So she was out a lot, but she's been laid off from her mall job since the mall is now closed. Oh, yeah. Um. She, she, though, is coping the best of all of us. She seems perfectly content to be home all the time, study, watch YouTube. She's like, cooking. Um, I haven't cooked in two and a half weeks. She's cooked dinner every single night since the start of this. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so she she's, seems to be just fine yeah. with, with all of this. Yeah. That's, um, and me, I run. That's fantastic. I, I run from a couple of... Um, empty nesters that had college age kids come back and it's been the exact opposite of that the college kids the mm -hmm. first thing that they asked when they got back was so what's for lunch mom <laughs> because they no. didn't have the cafeteria available to them <laughs> right no i'm very fortunate she's i mean honestly i'm gonna have to start running twice a day she's been cooking so much instead yeah. of just once five days a week yeah <laughs> um all right, so uh, let's get back more into like the the media insurance piece of this. Um, this was something that we discussed in the agents and brokers um, call that we did recently. That's probably going to be released about the time as this. Um, but the uh, the the concept of certain state legislators um, looking at trying to enforce BI coverage or business interruption coverage. Um, for insurance companies and, and to the benefit of insurers, but for insurance companies that never collected any premium for these type of losses for a pandemic, right? Um, and just anyone who's watching this who might be a, a little bit kind of on the, the unfamiliar side, whether you you live most of your life on the casualty side or maybe you're not even in the insurance industry, business interruption coverage traditionally requires some kind of physical loss. It's a bad fire, it's a storm, it's it's something that actually damages real property um, and stops you from being able to operate or limits your operation um, and maybe even causes some act of civil authority. The perfect example I give to everyone is Superstorm Sandy hit the New Jersey coastline. We have barrier islands that have a big, uh, you know, tourism base to them. And many of the uh, cro you know, paths that got you from the mainland to the barrier island were closed by the authorities, that's an act of civil authority that stops you from being able to operate business. Well, a lot of these legislatures, New Jersey leading the way for the most part in a lot of this, um, is looking at trying to force these insurance companies to pay for losses that otherwise aren't necessarily contemplated in the contract. Um, let's see, who do I want to throw this first? I, Rich, I mean, uh, from, from your estimation, you usually typically don't mince words. I think you're a really calculated guy. I mean, what do you think from this respect? And and I'm not really worried too much about 
a you know a political statement or anything like that. Um, but you know, is, is, what exactly is kind of your take on on this legislative, you know, what they're calling relief, I guess? So I think in, in moments of crisis, people naturally look at all options. Um, to change the rules where policy language has been explicit kind of halfway through the game is a little tough, especially because premiums haven't been collected and this hasn't been contemplated. So inherently there will be questions, there will be things thrown at the courts, there will be different interpretations, there will be appeals, and there will be final judgments. I think out of all of this, this provides an opportunity similar to what happened after 9-11 to kind of see, okay, where is the backstop to this? Is it something that's funded federally? Um, just because you, you kind of look at, and at some point we'll probably see, get a true cost to the economy, right? Yep. And to individual business of, of what this has caused. And at that point, make decisions on, on, you know, what insurance as an industry can provide, if anything. Yep. Or if we have to, you know, continue to rely on kind of the backstops that exist today. Um, yeah, this is these are the losses most likely. Yeah. Um, I, what, what, what's your sense of it, Laura? I mean, you work on the regulatory side. Is that is this being contemplated or um, even thought about in terms of you know rate filing or any of the regulatory work that has to be done? So we we have not, to, to my knowledge, contemplated making any any filings associated with this. That said, there's also some other states, I think Maryland in particular, who's indicated they believe there should be some rate relief due to the, the shutdown for, say, auto insurance and have offered to expedite insurer, an insurer filings to provide rate relief for that. So right. I think you're seeing um, regulators trying to provide some relief to consumers from that, that respect. Right. Some of the conversation I've heard relative to trying to legislate um, business interruption coverage where it didn't really exist before and was not priced is concerns about solvency. And if this legislation is to pass, what does that mean for you know individual insurers who did not price for this and maybe ultimately have a large exposure um, in terms of, of solvency in, in their future? Right. So I, I think the, the trades have been um, active in engaging legislators in those states, in particular New Jersey with their draft legislation, but I'm sure in other states as well, with one of their primary concerns being solvency. Yeah, I I think that's that's an important thing to mention here is, you know, what certain states do sets a precedent, right? In the insurance industry, we have some coordinating bodies like the NAIC and things like that, that um, really kind of collaborate to try and get somewhat of a consistent regulatory basis or a consistent method of operation, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we set a precedent here, it's not like we're just changing the coverage within a certain area. Um, we're, we're changing the coverage within, you know, uh, we're not just covering, you know, New Jersey or within a certain region. This is a, a national um, effect here. Um, oh, I love the fact that it uh, looks like Sue Sue's joined us, Sue Quimby um, from MSO. <laughs> um, Sue, Sue's one of the most uh, busy amongst us. Um, this is actually an opportune time for her to check in too. Uh, do we have uh, Do we have you on audio, Sue? If you, if you take you off, your, your spot, yeah. can you hear me? I'm oh. here. I'm here. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't. I couldn't get in for half an hour, so okay. here I am. <laughs> That's okay. It's all right. better, better late than never. Um, so uh, it, it's it's opportune that you ducked in here. I mean, you worked with MSO for a number of years. Um, have you heard anything, or has there been anything that out of MSO with respect to some of these latest legislative pushes to try and get business interruption covered? Well, we're actually working on sample policyholder notices to, for companies to, our companies to use to send to their clients to say this is what's covered and this is what not. For us, we do specific communicable disease exclusions in our policies for both property and liability. 
So as, as was mentioned before, the pricing is not there for these. Just like when we have things like floods, things that are catastrophes, you can't really price that and the insolvency is a, is a, is a true concern. But obviously, if, if the state decides that they're going to go and legislate and, and force people to cover that, we will have to step in and file program modifications. And, and, and also a comment on that auto thing. Sure, we can reduce reduce the rates now, but I wonder how fast they'll be to re increase the rates again once the crisis is over. Yeah. So there's a lot of things to consider. We want to respond and to help people, but we also have to step back and say, "Well, wait a minute. What are we really doing here? What are the long-term implications?" Right. Well, a little inside baseball: the, the auto liability rates, the 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 losses have exceeded the premium taken in for a number of years mm -hmm. now. I mean, it's been it's been a very painful line of business for a lot of insurers recently. Um, if anything, this is a nice little respite for them, but you know, giving them, you know, a two or three month buffer in terms of the, the, the surplus that they might, you know, um, get as a result of this. I, I think the the wrong line of thinking is, oh, well, you've collected all this money. Now it's time to redeploy it in some other line of coverage. I think it would be a mistake because like you said, you know, if, if it immediately goes back out the door, we're just going to go back into this kind of hard market where rates kind of increase. Um, just because you're in the new kid on the block, uh, we, we've talked about, you know, a lot of remote work type type questions here. How is working remotely affected you? I mean, has MS, has yourself or MSO been, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, set up for this for the last couple of years? Or is this some kind of like, you know, new ground that you guys are having to deal with? No, we, we were ahead of the curve. We've been, I've been working from home for about 10 years. We have people working all over the country. We're a very small company, but we're very spread out. Mm -hmm. So I have not actually even been in my office in probably a year. So oh, wow. the working from home and and, and, the, and the problem is technology. You yeah. saw I couldn't I couldn't get in. My entire system crashed and it was out for a while. And that seems to be the biggest thing for me now. So I'm used to working from home. I'm used to being able to schedule things, but we have all the technology we can talk to. We've got uh, we're in the cloud. But yeah. it's technology and everybody, the low drum of systems is where we're considering our issues. Yeah. I make a free call I couldn't get, get on because the, the lines were all used up. So the capacity is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so from from that standpoint, I, I think we're we're definitely going to see an emphasis moving forward on um, probably more I spending or at least an evolution of, of you know, what I budgets are spent on just for this very kind of dance happening that now all of a sudden you have to have a ton of people working from home. But I think companies may do a little bit better of a job embracing work from home. But um, maybe the next question I have for everyone, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, Rhea, just because you're kind of like banging the drum on this for a, for a long time now, is what, what do you think comes out of this? I mean, what do you think the, the evolution within specifically the insurance industry is going to be with respect to how we had to adopt uh, adapt to the present situation. I definitely don't think it's going to go back to the quote business as usual. I do believe employers are thinking, okay, this is a crisis. We'll get through it. And we'll bring everybody back to the office. Right. I think there are opportunities now where this can be used as a launch for more and more innovation and more creativity. And how we handle our industry handle situations that we face. You know, I do believe there will be a different level of risk assessment because we do have to take the compensation issue into play. Right. If an insurer is sending somebody home to work and they've not worked from home before, what's their ergonomic setup? Are they sitting at the dining room table? Or as when Tony and I were speaking, he was telling me about horse standing at their laptop in front of an ironing board. <laughs> That's the best. Yep. So I would see that there's got to be some kind of adjustments to accommodate that and what systems are put in place. Also timing, recognizing that when somebody's working from home or working remotely, they could be working non-standard hours. 
So don't necessarily expect everyone is going to be there from eight to four or nine to five or whatever the hours, the core hours happen to be. Yep. Be flexible with that. And then conversely, helping the leadership develop some of those competencies like empathy and understanding. And to Laura's point, being able to communicate differently, especially more verbal communication, more on the phone, not just sending a text message or an email. Right. So what are some big adjustments, I think? Yeah, those, those are some huge ones. I, I, just because she uh, she mentioned back to something that you had said, Laura, what, what do you think? I, how is this going to impact you or, or maybe impact the way that you think that your, your job is executed in the future? So I do think that um, our company may be more open to more remote work. I mean, we've traditionally had one day a week that you could work from home, and that may change given that, at least to date, it seems that the remote work has been quite successful. And, and not that there's not some bumps in the road. Um, my team definitely has had some bumps, but I think we've been really good at overcoming them. Um, but you, you may see um, more acceptance of more remote work um, rather than just the one day a week from home, it, particularly as we smooth out those bumps in the coming weeks, since this looks like it will at least be a few more weeks. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that may be the biggest thing, at least for ISO Veris in terms of, of coming out of this. Yeah. I think you, do you, you echo those feelings or, or uh, do you think something else also that might come out of this? Yeah, and I could also see employers or certain groups within companies, you know, wanting to spread a little bit more geographically and, and you know, you know, widening that talent pool, right? If, if we can do this for two months, why can't we do this 12 months out of the year? Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting how those discussions uh, evolve. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, what do you think, Ray? Well, my part of the business has been evolving in the last few years from uh, somebody physically going, what we would call a physical visit or a physical audit to some type of e-auditor or virtual audit anyway. Uh, in New York and New Jersey, uh, there are premium thresholds that the workers' comp years require that would require a, a physical visit. They relax them now during, during this crisis. So the question is, will they go back into effect once things go back to what we might call normal. Um, but there are always going to be certain accounts, and, and since you're a broker, Matt, you don't understand this. Your your biggest account, which is I don't know two or three million dollars in premium, do you want that insured to just send some records somewhere? Or do you want somebody to come because then does the auditor come? But it uh, you as the producer can come and 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 visit the the insured and and turn it into a some type of sales call or, or visit at the same time. So okay. I don't think um, it will completely eliminate a physical visit for an audit, but uh, for for smaller premium accounts or similar accounts, it, it may uh, take something that was trending and, and make it permanent. Right. Yeah, a little, little trade secret. Um, brokers are always looking for reasons to make a house call. Right. Um, can it be something annoying? Right. There has to be some some value or there has to be an olive branch that you're bringing. Um, but brokers are always looking for a justification to stop in. I've had a number of clients talk to me. You know, I, I routinely do safety meetings like every quarter with a number of my clients. And I've had a number of the decision makers say, you know, doing it on and this is going to change everything that we do. And I'm like, yeah, probably. But then in the back of my head, I'm screaming like, all right, now I've got to figure some other ways where, you know, I need to be able to get in front of these clients and, and really kind of create that person, a person, human interaction. So there's going to be some complications. I mean, it'll, I think it's going to get more efficient in certain respect, but also there's, there's going to be some, some bumps along the road. Um, Sue, what do you think? I mean, how do you how do you see the world changing as a result of uh, it? Sounds it sounds like you guys have been extremely progressive uh, up until now, but um, do you see any changes on the horizon as far as the way business is conducted? Well, I've I've seen we, we had our the audit and inspection that was the issue of, 
where we were creating a crisis. Well, okay, how do we adopt adopt uh, a new process? They can't go and, and inspect. They can't do the physical workers' comp audit. My feeling is that these people, a lot of companies, and a lot of state insurance departments found them hopefully unprepared for this. Yeah. When you get a letter from the insurance department saying, please withdraw all your non essential filings because we don't know what we're doing, it kind of makes you look, stand back and say, hmm. Well, hopefully, it'll be a learning experience and an eye opener for people. But, and maybe the fact that they will be able to expand their talent pool and accessibility, people who can work from home, maybe they can't get, get be mobile, maybe they'll, you know, the ADA type exposures, but have more people will be brought into this blood pool. Yeah, I'm, I've definitely seen a trend in terms of so as as younger folks get more into specifically the the government, whether it's you know within the regulatory bodies or into elected official roles, you you're becoming you're you're seeing more and more conversation about the requirement for technology, IT, remote, more efficient systems, things like that. Um, look, I mean, gov government's always going to be to react because government is, you know, not not in the political sense, but in the kind of like the psychological sense. People who are always uh, conservative, it might not see it. When they, you know, you might not see it when they talk on on TV, but you know, for the most part, when they make decisions, they're extremely conservative people because if they make a mistake, you know, there's going to be political backlash. Um, but I, I definitely see the point. I think I think a lot of the regulatory agencies have now seen that there needs to be some more funding pumped into their computer systems and their IT support systems. So um, hopefully uh, the the DMV has gotten a little bit more efficient. Maybe this will make it even more efficient in the future. Um, knock on wood. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I can definitely see that as a trend moving forward. Um, all right, cool. So. Uh, I, I think we've we've definitely kind of like talked about the remote uh, piece of this and, and kind of our different roles. I, I want to sum up with a little bit more of a lighthearted question for everyone. Um, and it's not uh, who's wearing shorts right now. I thought I'd open with that one, but <laughs> I'm looking at you, Rick. <laughs> but it's, uh, but it's been in your guilty pleasure, what what, what is your um, you know your your Netflix binge or, or your um, your escape or, or your books or, or whatever you've been getting into in order to kind of like we were like we were talking about unplug, decompress, and and kind of deal with the, the situation. Um, uh, I'll start off with you, Laura. But, uh, besides running, has there been anything else that you've been uh, kind of been indulging in? Um, I've watched a bit more Netflix than I typically do. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, a murder mystery that takes place in Iceland, one might not think is, is uplifting, but I am enjoying the, the Valhalla murders okay. on Netflix. Um, I tend to like police procedural type dramas, and this one is actually filmed in Iceland, in Icelandic, so it is, is dubbed in English, but they did a really pretty good job. And I'm fascinated with Iceland. It's probably number one on my list of places I'd like to go for more than a two-hour layover on the way to Europe. Yep. So uh, I'm I'm enjoying seeing a little bit of it uh, from Netflix side. That sounds fantastic. What about you, Rick? Well, I'm, you know, Rita had, had this on Facebook the other day, so I'm going to say the same answer I did before, and that's I've been starting TV off the day. And uh, I rediscovered a radio station called WBGO, which is a jazz station that's been on the radio for how long? It is 60 years, maybe. But um, by having satellite radio in a car, you don't listen to terrestrial radio anymore. And just being home and, you know, being beaded 24 hours a day with, even when you're watching regular TV, they cut in with news conferences about the epidemic. And it's just, it's just better to turn the TV off and have music on while you're working. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, um, that's that's interesting. Uh, Jack, is that that so? That's a local station to what, New Jersey. Yeah, it's eighty-eight point three. It's a jazz station. Okay, awesome. The North. Yeah, I, uh, that sounds fantastic. What about you, Sue? We haven't really 
haven't changed much. My husband's been retired for a number of years, so he's home during the day. He, he, he'll watch his, his, his we, there's no sports to watch now, so he'll watch his business channel. I've been trying to reach out to people. We have my insurance professionals group that was supposed to have our conference this week, and I'm trying to reschedule and move things around so we can do a lot of the things that we were going to do up in Vermont virtual. That's kind of been taking up a lot of my brain cells. Yeah, I, that's, that's a good point. Uh, we were supposed to have, um, coming up the end of April, the leadership uh, summit uh, for the CPCU Society. Um, Rita sits on the leadership council, and you know I think you guys are doing a good job of transitioning to a virtual event on that one. So I didn't even really kind of broach that topic, but I know a lot of those, you know, seminars or conventions um, or schedule from, you know, early March until, say, the end of April or even into May are being canceled or, or transitioned to, to virtual. So um, that's also something that I could probably do a, a full video on here. Uh, hopefully that doesn't affect our identity uh, in, in uh, late September, October. So, uh, that would be uh, something that we'll have to watch out for, but I'm going to knock on wood on that one. That seems a little far out there. Um, what about you, Rich? What's your, what's your guilty pleasure? A lot of, uh, what, uh, Paw Patrol with the kids, or what are you watching? You know it. Uh, I'm probably like the rest of the country, Tiger King. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it's it's certainly interesting, but uh, I also bought myself one of those very expensive bicycles. I won't mention the company name. Uh, those st stationary bikes, and if I'm a little, a little stiff, it's because I've been going at it pretty hard over the past five or six days. Yeah. Um, just trying to make the most of that very expensive purchase. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I I I, um, I I wish I could say I've been physically active. Than I have been. But, uh, I, I'd, I'd be lying to the, be lying to the, the choir here. <laughs> uh, what about you, Rita? What, what's your, your guilty pleasure as of late? Well, my guilty pleasure has been binge watching everything on investigative discovery. I love concert. I like the procedures. I like the procedurals because they're fiction. Discovery. These are reenactments that people have done. Oh. Other people. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And I've been. Yeah. I mean, I... this is a couple of shows I didn't even know about before. Yeah. <laughs> I. Well, uh, that's I That's interesting. I've my wife and I have con kind of gone in the the the, the opposite direction, I guess. Um, uh, more kind of like fantasy adventure. So there's a series called Outlander that's on Netflix. It's actually technically, I think, a Showtime series. Um, full disclosure, it's a little. Uh, you de definitely don't watch it when you get back to the office because it's a little not safe for work. I think it was based off of like romance novels or something like that, but. Um, uh, the, the gist of it is it, it's a, a, a woman who was in World War II, a British nurse for the war, um, and finds that she can basically time travel, and she ends up time traveling back to the 1700s Scotland during the Jacobite Revolution. Um, pretty interesting. It makes you makes you think about you know time and and all that good stuff like uh, you know when you're watching like Terminator and some of those other films that have to do with going back and forth. But, um, our, so this has been good. I, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate this. this is uh, look anyone's in the insurance industry that might watch this video, <clears throat> please follow the New Jersey chapter. Whether it's on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, even on Instagram, and please feel free to reach out to any of us on LinkedIn if you want to connect, or if you have other questions about some of the topics that we discussed today. And uh, I'll also provide some, some links in the uh, the comments below for everyone for reference to. 
um, everyone's, you know, either LinkedIn profile or their place of work, just so we can give everyone the, the due um, or, or give everyone the mention that they're due. So thank you, everyone.